we're talking okay. about. Okay, we're live. We're here together, Marco and me. Marco Mangelsdorf uh, from Provision Solar joins us by Skype audio from Hilo. And we love to talk to Marco because we get such insights and thoughtfulness. I don't mean that personally, Marco. I'm sorry. I, I don't want to offend you in any way. That's Marco Mangelsdorf. Hi, Marco. Hello there, Jay. And I tell you, there would not be as much aloha and aloha Friday if I weren't talking to you at this very moment. Yes, this, this really makes it. I mean, I really do want to uh, establish a regular interval with you so we put it on the calendar and we know what we're going to do and when. Anyway, so uh, so much is happening. It's incredible. I mean, we could talk every day, actually. Maybe we should. Um, today, we're uh, tiling this thing, this discussion. Joint application filed hyphen what now, question mark. And we are, you know, we are on the sleigh ride now. This thing is moving right down the pike. You know, two months ago, uh, Nextera and uh, Hawaiian Electric announced their deal. Their $4.3 million, billion, may I say, billion dollar deal. Um, now, here we are, uh, what is it, January, what is it, January 30, 30th, and now we got an application pending, so it's getting serious. And um, that application is huge. It's like almost 400 pages, am I right? 374, but I tell you, I was actually kind of surprised it was that short. I was kind of <laughs> harking back to the documents that Hawaiian Electric submitted to the PUC back in August, which were uh, regarding uh, their energy plans on various levels, and those were 2,700 plus. So, I mean, this is a, a Cliff Notes version compared to, to previous docs. <laughs> I guess it's a breath of fresh, of fresh air, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and you take out the appendices and it shortens it even more. So uh, let's hear it for being short, sweet, and concise. <laughs> Okay, did you, did you go through it all, or do you want to take just part? <laughs> Why don't you give me your summary, Marco, from what you did look at? Well, I have to admit, first of all, that I had not had a chance to dive into it all that deeply. I received it last night, and uh, it, it seems that uh, Hawaiian Electric and the next year are trying to make the strongest case possible in terms of this deal being in the public benefit. And it's uh, kind of the opening gate or opening act of what's going to be a, a multi-act drama in the months, if not longer, to come as various parties come forward to uh, support or more likely challenge various aspects of the deal. So I, I don't have kind of a quick uh, synopsis in terms of is it good, is it bad. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, they, they make a, a strong as case as possible for their side that why this, in fact, this merger, this acquisition is in the public interest, and it'll be up to multiple parties, of course, uh, both here and the state and also on the mainland, to, to make that final determination of whether the proposal as proposed uh, meets that criterion. Yeah, well, interesting. I mean, public interest is, uh, I mean, in the past, I don't think public interest has, has included as many elements uh, or as many points on which it could be, it could be uh, rejected. Um, you know, public interest uh, catches, in this case, it seems to catch a lot of things that I myself wouldn't care too much about. Um, but here we are in the land of pincushion, and um, there's an awful lot of material coming out. You know, uh, you weren't here in, in Honolulu, and I don't think it was broadcast in any detail, but there was a hearing earlier this week. Um, I want to say, what, Wednesday was it? Um, at the legislature, and it was a, a, an all-afternoon sucker. Uh, it was called by no less than four committees, four committees, um, on the deal. And, and uh, Alan Oshima from Hawaiian Electric and uh, Eric Gleason uh, from Nextera appeared to, uh, you know, make a very short presentation, which again, you know, speaks for respect for brevity. Um, and then there was questions from uh, the four count them, four committees that were there. And some of the questions uh, were, you know, I would say tough, antagonistic even, and other questions were friendly. Uh, that's kind of interesting. I mean, one question I remember, for example, was um, a representative from um, Pune uh, got up and said, you know, I'm, I'm happy to see uh, what you guys did, what Hawaiian Electric did when we had our outage in Pune. You came right away. This is after the uh, storm. <clears throat> you came right away and you fixed it right away. We really appreciate it. And she stroked him and uh, she said, you know, will, will Nextera be as responsive 
And uh, Eric Gleason said, well, you know, we, we, we know Florida. In Florida, they have storms and, you know, catastrophes left and right all the time. And uh, they know how to go out into the hinterland and fix things. So um, it, it wouldn't be anything new for Nextera. And that was a good part. Uh, but there were also tough questions like, would you share your internal numbers with us, which I think is an inappropriate question. Uh, or uh, can you give us your exact plan? Um, and when they said, you know, hey, we're 60 days past announcement, um, the particular legislator said, well, we're going to want your exact plan. We're going we're to want everything you plan to do in detail uh, from the drawing boards um, before we approve this. And, you know, and the funny thing about it, actually, which I find so interesting, and this is what I would put to you, actually, Marco, um, what do you mean we approve it? That's not the law. The legislature is not the one to approve this. This is not a legislative function. This is a PUC function. And, I, you know, we have seen this so often before where the legislature subsumes its own statutory agencies and steps into the shoes. I mean, it sounds funny, but... The legislature is making itself into the PUC. What's going on? Right. And then in the well, meanwhile, I, I, the PUC I, hasn't they haven't had the new chair confirmed, so they're kind of stuck. They can't do anything. The legislature is doing it all for them. I, I mean, I really wonder if whether that's an appropriate use of taxpayer money. Sorry. Well, I would tend to, to, to side with that uh, that analysis, Jay, and, uh, I, and I agree with you. I. At the same time as a political scientist, to not expect the people's body, in this case the legislature of the state of Hawaii, the House and the Senate, to expect them to sit on their hands as the biggest deal of the history of the state and prior territory and kingdom as the biggest deal goes down for the biggest corporation in the state, it would be unreasonable to think that somehow, some way, the legislature would just sit back and allow the regulatory bodies to, to make the decision. Now, to what extent the legislature can, in fact, do much tangibly, practically, I think is certainly subject to debate, but I'm not surprised at all. No, I mean, you, no you wouldn't be surprised, it, it, because in Hawaii, the legislature is squat in the middle of everything, you know? I mean, like, it manages the university, which is like six minutes away on the freeway. Uh, it manages everything, and uh, actually, I you know I don't I don't think that it's efficient to do that. And uh, you know, in the case of Comcast, you know the the acquisition of Time Warner by Comcast, uh, the FCC is going to make that deal. Now there may be you know litigation over it, but you know uh, at, the, at the outset, which is going to actually happen next month, February, by my recollection, they're going to make their decision. That's it. They're the agency charged by law with doing that. Congress is not going to make that decision. And what's odd here is, you know, I mean, I wouldn't disagree with you that um, the legislature is just itching to get involved, but this is a little early. I mean, they, they, they hadn't even filed their application, and they were spending all day in the legislature answering questions. Uh, there's something that really strikes me as backward about that. And, and the PUC couldn't even begin. And they're the agency charged with doing it. U upside down, sorry. <laughs> No, I agree. I mean, uh, it's, it's this really kind of strange confluence of, of timing and events that one of the biggest deals to come down the pike in, in a very, very long time in our state has a public utilities commission where the chair is has resigned and the new appointee, uh, Randy Iwasa, as far as I know, uh, there has been no schedule uh, made yet uh, for his hearing before Roz Baker's committee on the Senate side. So, I mean, there's so much to be done, and still uh, the, the PUC is not, uh, not settled, either from the, the, from the top with the three commissioners that need to be seated and doing their work, as well as from all from what I can read in the press, uh, they need help on the admin and bureaucratic side as well. So... Uh, I just, I'm, I'm somewhat concerned, I guess, that given everything that's on their plate, especially regarding energy issues and energy dockets, uh, I, I wonder how they're going to be able to churn through this in a timely fashion in the, uh, in the months to come. Yeah, this is a hard job. They've got to do their diligence. They, they have to get their staff activated. They've got to find out everything that they should know. 
And then they've got to make an analysis around this pretty vague statement of, uh, what did you say, B uh, best, best interests of the community? In the public interest. Public interest. It's a hard one because it's so vague. And I mean, they don't want to be criticized for not covering some issue or, or, or another. Uh, so they got to begin right away. And it's got to be systematic and defensible what they do. Uh, well, and let me also add one more regulatory agency, which is going to be very critical, is the, the FERC, is the Federal Energy Regulatory uh, Commission on, in Washington. And uh, this is up their alley as well. So they will also have to give their approval for something like this to take place. So you know, from what I can tell, it's going to be the Public Utilities Commission in Honolulu and the FERC in Washington that will have the most uh, sway and power to determine the how and why of this moving forward. Yeah, and, and the, uh, the, the, the forces that would oppose this merger, uh, this acquisition, are, you know, already organized and in place. And, I mean, it's hard to see exactly who's doing what, because a lot of it is backdoor. Um, you know, that, that, that four-committee hearing didn't happen, uh, you know, spontaneously. There's been plenty of activity already in the legislature behind, behind closed doors about this. And, and it would appear... It would appear to me that the, uh, the opposition forces are, are two. Uh, one is the environmental uh, forces that uh, you know, aren't satisfied with uh, Nextera's uh, environmental commitment. And um, two, uh, the uh, photovoltaic community that you know, we've been talking about, who are right. essentially desperate and somehow see uh, the drift on this deal as a drift away from rooftop solar uh, and, and see that as, um, you know, uh, under, further undermining their position in the marketplace. Do uh, you have any thoughts about where the opposition... Is, is, is that an accurate statement as far as you're concerned, Marco, about where the opposition might come from? Uh, do you have any, any thoughts about that? I think I would add a third probably, Jay, which is the concern about what this is going to mean for basic uh, kitchen table uh, uh, bread and butter issues for Hawaii homeowners, which is, is my bill going to stay the same? Is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? And that is, uh, it's, it's going to be a, it's a almost impossible question to answer, really, uh, as you're peering into the future, especially with the wild fluctuations of the price of oil, which last I saw was under $45 a barrel as of a day or two ago, which has a huge effect or substantial effect on Hawaii energy prices, to both for, of course, transportation and power generation. So I would say the third aspect of um, the challenges could come from folks who are uh, maybe concerned the prices will, will increase or, or not go down. And I think if you look at the application that was filed yesterday by HEI and NextEra, they, they tried to make a strong case for, if I'm not mistaken, holding pricing uh, for four years without any uh, attempted uh, rate increases. So uh, I think they're, they're, they're anticipating uh, that uh, concern in terms of, uh, which a very legitimate one in terms of what is this going to do to my electric bill. But I, I will comment on, uh, on the solar electric industries or solar industries challenge to, uh, to uh, what's going on in terms of the merger. And, and I find it somewhat ironic, if not well, certainly very interesting, that Hawaiian Electric over the past several years has been uh, vilified with blistering oftentimes blistering rhetoric and hyperbole from uh, various uh, colleagues of mine in the industry uh, as just being obstructionist, as being anti-solar, as seeing solar as somehow pushing them down the so-called death spiral, death spiral. And it, it, it's been very heated and uh, over the top, in my opinion, sometimes. And, and yet now that there's the prospect of Hawaiian Electric going into uh, to the, the hands of a different owner, it's become, well, we're, we're more concerned about uh, Hawaiian Electric uh, being taken over by the devil we don't know compared to the devil that we do know. And please, you know, don't let that happen until, until our concerns are, are allied. So uh, it, it just we, we live in such interesting times. It's almost, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's kind of head spinning in terms of the stuff that's coming out. Yeah, we well, you know part of this has to be a lack of confidence in the structures that are, you know, legally the ones that should be making these decisions. You know, I mean, at the bottom line, there's the cool, real, logical, legal answer to all of that is look at the law. 
And the law says you have a public utilities commission. Now, until a few years ago, it didn't have much to do in energy. Um, but, it, but now it's clear that it's, energy is its primary t you know, uh, uh, assignment. Um, and energy is complex. And you say, well, a deal like this and a, and a new owner like this is subject to the regulation of the PUC. So whatever the terms, whatever the conditions of the approval are, two years go by, there's a problem. What happens? Well, the PUC regulates this utility. If it's going to be a monopoly utility, the PUC regulates it. Five years go by, same thing. Eight, it's all the time, you know, every day, regulated by the regulators, the PUC. But, you know, for some strange reason, people, including the legislature, don't have confidence that the existing structure will do what it's supposed to do. In, in truth, we have to have confidence in the PUC. We have to believe that they will do the job of regulating this utility, that the utility won't walk over them. And you know, yeah. I, 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 I have more confidence than the average guy in the street. I think the average guy in the street doesn't even see this issue. What do you think? I think the average guy on the street, if you say, what do you think of the Hawaii PUC, you'll get uh, from the majority of people you ask, you'll get a quizzical look. <laughs> uh, seriously, they won't know what you're talking about. And those who do know, well, does that stand for Public, uh, public Utilities Commission? You say, yes, it does. You say, Can you tell me anything about what, in fact, they do? And you'll get continued quiz quizzical looks. It's not, you know, but the truth, it's not the average guy. It's not only the average guy in the street. It's the whole government. They just don't believe that this, this, that this can be managed. And uh, before we go to the break, I just want to tell you about a program we're doing here at Think Tech in April uh, where we're, we're covering the subject of uh, offshore investment. And this, actually, this deal is offshore investment. It's $4.3 billion of offshore investment. And we're asking, yeah. you know, is Hawaii properly managing offshore investment and how can if it's not then how can Hawaii better manage offshore investment you know and so I mean the, the, you can you can approve this deal with no management probably a mistake you can approve this deal you can disapprove this deal or make it so hard you know that next era says enough with you guys we're leaving town or you can manage the deal it isn't obvious it is obvious that that's the best choice of all the choices for this community to take to take a huge investment like this and manage it with appropriate regulation, with appropriate conditions, and an ongoing, you know, oversight. Um, and I don't know why people don't see it though. Anyway, we're going to cover this in April in our Think Tech Downtown Forum. But uh, having said that, let's take a short break, Marco. Um, this is Marco and me. We're, Marco's from Provision Solar. Joins us by Skype from uh, Hilo. And we're talking about uh, the joint application of Hawaiian Electric and uh, Nextera just filed. What now? And we're going to tackle the what now part right after this break. Aloha. I'm Hunter Hevelin, host of Sustainable Hawaii here at Think Tech Hawaii. You can tune in every week on Thursday at 2 p.m. to see interviews with sustainability professionals from around the state and even further abroad, learning about activities with water management, food security, waste management, and a whole host of other uh, fascinating opportunities to get engaged with making a greener island. So if you're interested in making the transition from consuming individuals to communities of producers, check us out every Thursday. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here on Friday with Marco and me, 11 to 12. Marco Mangelsdorf, ProVision Solar and Hilo. Uh, and we're talking about the joint application filed by Hawaiian Electric in this next era uh, to, to uh, allow next era to... Um, uh, acquire a Hawaiian Electric. And we're asking Marco now, what now? So what happens after this? So there's an application pending. What, what do you see unfolding here? Well, the uh, interveners, or the, uh, the wannabe interveners on this docket, of which there will be uh, uh, quite a few, who knows the exact number, they have, if I'm not mistaken, 20 days to file their motion. And there will be a cutoff date, uh, if my math is correct, to looking at the calendar sometime on or around February 26th. And then the PUC hopefully will be fully staffed up, at least with three, uh, three uh, full-time commissioners there. Hopefully Randy Urasa will, will be able to sit behind his desk uh, sooner rather than later. And they will make a determination as to uh, which uh, uh, petitioners deserve to be granted intervener status on uh, 
the criteria that they use to make such a decision. And then time will go by with the PUC chewing on uh, the application from HEI and Xterra, as well as the various motions uh, for and against uh, the DLS proposed by the interveners. Well, you know, I mean, hearing that the uh, opportunity to comment is going to expire in only, you know, mid-February, um, it seems to me, just, it strikes me that a year, everybody estimating this process is going to take a year. A year sounds too long. Do we really need a year? Do they really need a year? I know the, I know the PUC uh, is not known for its uh, alacrity. Um, on the other hand, they have a new chair here, and maybe he can change that, and maybe the PUC can rule on this whole affair uh, in less than a year. And, and the reason I, I feel that's an important point of discussion is that while this deal is pending there at the PUC, everything is jammed up. And it has yeah. uh, all kinds of ripple effects through the energy community where everyone, in, including all the agencies, including Hawaiian Electric itself, um, you know, is all sitting there waiting for a decision. And we won't be able to move ahead with nearly the same speed and energy and, you know, momentum um, or innovation, if you will, uh, while we're sitting around waiting for that decision. Wouldn't it be a lot better to do this sooner than later, Marco, one way or the other? Well, it would. It would, certainly. But, I mean, uh, it's not as if this is the only thing on their plates. I mean, uh, Tuesday of last week, Hawaiian Electric submitted to the PUC a 100-plus page document, which uh, seeks to bring to a formal close the fantastically successful net energy metering program, which we've had in the state since July of 2001. And uh, needless to say, that's a very uh, big thing to my community, to the PV businesses and, uh, and groups out here in terms of changing the playing field for grid-type solar, for rooftop solar. So that's something that Hawaiian Electric has asked the PUC for an expedited uh, decision on, asking them to uh, please give us something definitive by the 20th of March, which I think, uh, you know, of course, they're perfectly able and willing to ask that, but whether that's realistic uh, right now, given that we don't even have three commissioners, is probably something of a stretch. But, I mean, there are just multiple very important dockets that they have on their plate that they you know, you, they have to prioritize. What are they going to handle first? What are they going to put the most effort into? And uh, and, and they can't be single-focused. I mean, they, they have to be able to uh, multitask uh, as, as well as possible, given what's on their plate. Yeah. All true, but uh, boy, they take a long time. And when they take a long time, you have a community effect but by reason of the delay itself. And I mean, just in a, in a hypothetically, uh, a hypothetical um, possibility, if they came in in March and they made a decision right away on this, we'd all be better off. Uh, that's, that's my view of it. And, and, and that goes for a lot of the dockets that are filed. I mean, you know, the PUC traditionally has lived in a world of cobwebs. Uh, and now this is a time to speed it up. So uh, shouting out to uh, Randy Iwasi, Randy, can you make it happen faster? That would be good for everybody. You know, <clears throat> I, uh, I went through the, uh, the first part, anyway, of the application that was filed, Marco, and I found a, one section that I thought was worthy of our discussion, the section 1B on page 10. And it says, Next Era Energy's commitments to communities, employees, and customers. Uh, and I think this is interesting because this is kind of a sort of short laundry list of what the PUC will be looking at and making factual or judgment decisions on whether these statements are true and how they bear on, um, you know, the question of whether it's in the public interest. So I'd like to go through them with you, if I may. The first one is community to make, rather commitment to maintain charitable giving. Um, I don't think it has a lot to do with, uh, you know, community, uh, uh, community interest, but um, that's, they're citing that as the number one point on the list. Uh, what do you think about that? Is that really part of this decision? Well, I, I think it is because, I mean, HEI over the years has had a charitable, charitable foundation that they have used to support good causes, important causes uh, across the state. So I would expect, uh, I would have been shocked if they had decided to end that. I mean, that would be incredibly poor PR, or very bad business decision. So it shows a, uh, a commitment to wanting to still 
be very much supportive of the community and and uh, and the causes uh, that are, are worth supporting uh, across the state for typically those people who have less means and who are in more unfortunate circumstances than many of us. So I, I think that makes a lot of sense that they yeah. would. I certainly agree because I think that HECO, uh, you know, all the vilification it's, it has suffered in recent years, the fact is it's been a good citizen and um, it is a local company to the fullest degree on all the islands it serves and uh, it, has, it has integrated with the people, it touches the people, it touches many, many, many structures um, and it would be awful to have it, you know, go sterile on that level such as the big box stores seem to do, and not touch the people, not be local, not support community activities. It, uh, I certainly agree with you on that. Well, uh, and a fantastic example are my friends at, at Helco who were just phenomenal uh, during the, uh, the hurricanes, the one that, you know, one after the other, that did substantial damage to the uh, Puna district of the island. And it wasn't, uh, I, I have no doubt that, the, the, the motivations for Jay Ignacio, the president of Helco, there and his staff to get out there on a day-to-day -day in the trenches basis. There wasn't wasn't some type of calculated, oh, we're, we're going to try to show that we are the good corporate citizen or good community citizen. I, I, I found it I found it 100 percent genuine that these are members, the workers at Helco, whether they're the engineering staff or the workers in the office or the line people. I mean, they're part of the community. And they did a fantastic job, uh, you know, working incredibly long days, cleaning up the devastation and trying to bring power back to people, as well as even just trying to help people with more mundane concerns like ice for their ice chests because their refrigeration was unavailable. So uh, I, I see the utility companies uh, as being integral parts of the community. I mean, because they, they are us and we are them, really. Yes, and it's got to remain that way. I mean, after all... Uh, we want this to. We want Hawaii to be the best place on earth. We want this whole state to be unified and integrated, and excellent. And uh, it really needs. If we're going to have a monopoly utility, we really want this to continue. Another one is uh, commitment to local management. This is also critical because you need local management if you want to, you know, integrate the company with local activities and be sensitive to local requirements and local sensibilities. Um, so I, I guess, you know, I would, well, how do you, how do you feel this, where, where does this play against, um, you know, in the public interest? Well, look at it from this perspective, Jay. It would have been highly uh, advised against and, and, uh, and incredibly stupid to do if they had said anything other than what they said. If they had hinted at wholesale changes we're going to manage this from Juneau Beach. I mean, the, the, the results were, would have been very predictable. So they, had to, they, they almost had to say what they said in terms of we're not going to have massive shakeups. It's still going to be very local. So I, I wouldn't have expected anything otherwise. There's a, there's a year limit, isn't there? Uh, it refers to another section in the, in the joint application, and I think the other section has a... Uh, a number of years. In other words, they're not going to let anybody go for X years. I think it's two years. Two years, yeah. Um, and so uh, I guess, um, you know, the question is what happens after two years and uh, how important is that uh, to whether this is in the public interest. Uh, of course, you know, the, any, any uh, smart acquirer is going to want to maintain local connection anyway, especially here. Um, but uh, this isn't forever. And uh, if, if you're um, a, a corporation with stockholders, need to make money, need to be efficient, uh, you're going to make some personnel changes when you can. So how do you see that unfolding? I mean, this is a hard-driving business corporation that's got a great track record in terms of making profits and paying dividends and you know, being in the black and expanding you know, and acquiring. Uh, right. Aren't they going to make some changes at, at some point in time? Well, I mean, there, there is a natural turnover, right, in any type of organization. And the larger the organization, the, the greater the turnover is going to be just by sheer numbers, right, not necessarily by percentage, but by sheer numbers. And I think typically when you've got things like this happening, there's probably a bump in people leaving, a bump in, in, in retirements, early retirements perhaps. So I think there will kind of naturally be new blood that will be coming in. And, uh, I mean, if, if the next era 
folks uh, in Florida know uh, know what's good for them, which I believe they do, I give them credit for that, is that they're going to be very, very careful and very cautious in terms of uh, substantive and significant, if not, you know, wholesale changes uh, at management, on the management level, assuming that this deal goes through. And uh, to do otherwise would be, would be almost suicidal. I mean, they have to be careful. They have to be cautious and uh, and not come across as you know the stereotypical over the decades if not century or longer of outsiders coming to our little state and uh, thinking that they have a better way of doing things and thinking of things and uh, and feeling hell bent sometimes to impose that on the locals yeah. so I, I have to give uh, give next year credit for for not being in that mold because it would be incredibly incredibly stupid on their part from a business perspective so i don't think they're going to do that yeah. And I think they're saying the right thing here, um, but I think they're, you know, the PUC will have to evaluate how, how long that will continue and how deep it will run. Uh, one more thing. We, we've, we're covering some of these in multiple groups, but um, one more thing is uh, along the same lines is a commitment to local governance. And by that, they mean uh, uh, local board of directors, and they also talk about establishing a local independent advisory board, such as the red team, I, I suppose, that you and I have discussed. Um, and, and they're making a, a specific commitment in this application to do that, to create a, an advisory board, which would have no legal authority within the company, but would be there for advice. Um, and uh, I'm not sure what they're going to do about the board of directors. My guess is the board of directors, well, the board of directors will have to be elsewhere. So the advisory board is a way that they bring in local governance. Um, is this going to work? Is this going to satisfy people? I think it's uh, it's the right step uh, in terms of is it going to satisfy people? Uh, it'll probably satisfy some people and never satisfy others. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And it, you know, and, and if you if you don't like the deal for other reasons, you might pick on that one. <laughs> sure. Whether it's really a problem or not. Um, the next the next one that comes to that comes to uh, to mind here. Uh, that would be, um, and, and the last one really in terms of our discussion is uh, this commitment to clean energy transformation. Um, now we know that uh, Nextera has, is no stranger to clean energy transformation. It has transformed its own company. It, it has, uh, uh, although its percentage of clean energy is not that great, but its size is great, so you can understand that. But they know a lot, or at least they have indicated they know a lot about clean energy and that they are committed um, to continuing the initiative from 2008. Um, and my, my own view, by the way, is that they're treating Hawaii as a laboratory for clean energy where they can learn more here than they have learned elsewhere and then take those lessons to the rest of their system. But wh what are your thoughts about it? I mean, are, are, can they do this? Will they do this? Is this just frosting or is this the real, you know, the real essence of their, um, of their intention? Well, there's, uh, I can't speak to their intentions, Jay, and I don't think anybody can. But what I can say is that there's no doubt in my mind that now and over the past several years, Hawaii has become a true frontier and cutting edge in terms of how much can today's grid, today's electric utility grid, how much can today's grid out here handle in terms of distributed generation in the form of rooftop photovoltaic. That we are really pushing, collectively pushing the boundaries uh, far beyond what uh, we thought possible even three, let alone five, let alone ten years ago. And that we are continuing to attract uh, quite a bit of attention from Folks far and wide, uh, Department of Energy, U.S. Department of Energy in Washington, Natural, uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado, various groups in Japan, big corporations in Japan. Uh, so I think it makes sense. And if I was uh, top management or the board of Next Era and I was looking at ways to broaden my knowledge base or the corporate uh, knowledge base and portfolio to deal with what's going to be happening in greater and greater frequency on the U.S. mainland, I think it makes a tremendous amount of sense to grab Hawaiian Electric Industries and use that as a, as a very useful test lab to see what is likely to happen on the mainland in the years to come. Yeah, and to look at it from a national point of view, 
And maybe that's, uh, you know, maybe that can take us further than just a, a state point of view. Oh, there's one other one that I wanted to ask you about, Marco, and that is uh, a, a stated commitment to customer savings. You know, I mean, we always say that the clean energy initiative in large part has morphed into the cheap energy initiative. And, and, and that has become, that has become uh, a demand of the community and has become a, a commitment of Hawaiian Electric. Uh, can these guys pull it off? Um, will they be able to, uh, you know, meet the, meet the reduction in costs that Hawaiian Electric talks about? Uh, can they go beyond that? Should we count on this? Is this critical to the public interest? Well, absolutely it's critical to the public interest, but the cost of uh, generating electrical power out here, unless and until we are heavily uh, weaned from imported fossil fuels, will continue to be heavily influ influenced by imported fossil fuels. So that really is the key driver for energy costs out here. You can talk energy efficiency, you can talk more solar, uh, and all sorts of other important factors. But that is something that no utility company or no big corporation has ultimate control over is what is the cost of oil going to be on the world market, which uh, it directly affects what we're paying at the pump and also directly affects what we're paying to our local utility companies. So the, the best news in the world for consumers in the U.S. Uh, is for oil to stay sub $50, if not lower, a barrel. But who knows how long that's going to last. Yeah. So, it just, it's too early to tell too many variables to know whether lower electric cost is something that's going to be, uh, I, I would never be able to guarantee that. It's something you can work for, something that we can do, certainly uh, as a collective, but to promise it would be, would be foolish. One other point we should t talk about before we run out of time, Marco, and you're, you're very uh, knowledgeable about this, is, is this whole um, apparent movement from rooftop solar to uh, what I, people are starting to call community solar, that is solar farms, um, and there you know there's there's statements made on both sides of both sides of what, what works, and and you start to get the feeling that um, Nextera would like to see more solar farms. We interviewed First Wind a couple days ago here, and First Wind has. Uh, it was a wind company, but it's migrated to solar, and in fact, it's migrated to solar farms, and they're building a few of them for Hawaiian Electric, uh, and at the end of the day, you know, we're talking hundreds of megabytes of uh, solar farm input uh, into the grid, which in some ways is more efficient uh, than the house-by-house -house approach. And so this issue seems to be at stake, and it seems to be that the future is going to migrate to, er, to community solar, Instead of instead of a um, you know almost a, uh, a a total amount of solar on the rooftops, uh, things are changing. I mean, how does that bear on this transaction? How does it bear on public interest? How does it bear on where next era might take us? Well, before next era was even mentioned, uh, prior to uh, the announcement in early December, Hawaiian Electric has made clear over the months and years that they are trying to bring more solar generation online. That's, that's not disputable. And that they are trying to do so at a lower cost. That's not disputable, and that I do the same thing. And that the way to get solar at a lower cost is to have it more centralized. So they have been moving in this direction for the past several years, and it has nothing to do with Nextera in terms of trying to bring more renewable generation at a lower cost. And community solar would not only be theoretically cheaper than rooftop solar in terms of house to house to house. Instead, you have it uh, in more in a central location. But, uh, and I think this is one of the things that appeals to Mike Gabbard so much, who's really been pushing this to his credit, is that it al would allow people who don't have roof space, who are living in an apartment, who are living in a condo, who are living in an area or, or living someplace that can't put PV system on their roof, and this allows them to be, this would allow them to be able to take advantage of owning a portion of a PV system located somewhere else in the service territory where they would get a PV rate based on a pro rata, whatever they purchase basis. And I think that that makes a lot of sense. Oh, Marco, it's great to talk to you about this stuff. It's so, it, it so clarifies my thinking and my appreciation of, of the, the considerations involved. No one can say it's not complex. 
and no one can say it's uh, it's static it's moving all the time it's like every day so we should talk more often and I'll and I'll talk to you offline about uh, trying to set up uh, the next one of our discussions that's Marco Mangelsdorf of ProVision Solar he joins us by Skype audio from Hilo the show is Marco and me and I enjoy that I like the title of it too I'd like to tell you uh, and today we talked about uh, the joint application of Hawaiian Electric and Nextera, uh, which is just filed yesterday afternoon in the PUC, what now? And the what now part is a, is a point for discussion as we go forward. Thank you so much, Marco. Thank you very much. Uh, it certainly added uh, a strong and big dose of aloha for my Aloha Friday, Jay. <laughs> Same here, Marco. Thank Let's you. Let's talk soon. Aloha. Aloha.